Hi guys, welcome to another session of Under the Hood. This time we'll be looking at type systems. So I struggled to find any explanation from a low level of exactly how a JavaScript type system compi compiler is implemented. I, I understood many of the jobs of a type system, but was very unsure of the mechanisms involved and how they, these mechanisms work together. So this video is going to aim to shine a light on some of the fundamentals at work under the hood. It's just not possible to focus on everything in one video. So here we're going to be looking at type checks uh, specifically. Um, Starting with an overview of the type systems, then building our own compiler which, we, which can run type checks and output sensible messages. Uh, so for more help on transforms, please see my video and articles on web bundlers and all the one on source maps. Uh, and apologies as there is going to be some repetition in this video with my previous talk on source maps, but it's important to include some of the necessary uh, information to understand the mechanisms that we're going to be looking at in greater detail today. So, this talk is going to be broken down into two parts. So, part A will be an overview of the type system compilers, uh, including TypeScript. So, syntax versus semantics, what is AST, types of compilers, what does a language compiler do, how does a language compiler work, type system compiler jobs, and then a couple of the advanced type checker features. And then part B will be building our own type system compiler. It's going to include the parser, the checker, and then we're going to be running our compiler and then finally looking at what we would have missed. So, uh, on to part A, we'll start with an overview. So, something which is important to run over early is the difference between syntax and semantics. Uh, syntax is typically code which is native to JavaScript, essentially asking if the given code is correct for the JavaScript runtime. So, for example, uh, the snippet there is syntactically correct. Uh, semantics uh, is if this code is specific to the type system. So essentially asking if the given types attached to the code are correct. For example, the above is syntactically correct, but semantically wrong, uh, defining the variable as a number, but uh, setting, uh, defining it as a number, but setting it as a string. So that's semantically wrong. Before we go much further, we should take a quick look at one of the important mechanisms inside of any JavaScript compiler, that's AST. AST stands for Abstract Syntax Tree. It's basically a tree of nodes representing a program of code. A node is the smallest unit, possible unit, and it's basically a plain old JavaScript object, so a POJO, uh, with a type and a location property. Uh, all nodes have these two properties, but based on type, they can have various other properties as well. Uh, in AST form, code is very easy to manipulate, so operations like adding, removing, replacing are, are very easy to do. An example is the code on the left, uh, the add, uh, which would become the AST on the right. There are lots of websites out there, one such as astexplorer.net, which are great at letting you write some JavaScript code and immediately see its AST. So, moving on to compilers. There are two main types of compilers in the JavaScript ecosystem. Uh, the first type is a native compiler. Uh, a native compiler will convert code into a form that can be run by a server or computer, um, importantly in machine code. Uh, a compiler such as the one found in the Java ecosystem converts code into bytecode and then into native machine code. So Java, the Java ecosystem is a good example. Uh, the second type is a language compiler. A language compiler has, has, has a quite different role. Um, the compilers for TypeScript and Flow both count in the category as language compilers as they output code into JavaScript. The main difference with native compilers is that they compile for tooling's sake, so for optimizing code performance or adding additional features. Uh, not to produce machine code. So uh, let's start with the basics. So a couple of the core jobs found in a type system compiler are performing type checks. By this, I mean the introduction of types, uh, often via explicit annotations or implicit inter in inferences, uh, and a way to check that one type matches another. So for example, a string matches a number. Uh, there's also running a language server. Uh, for a type system to work in a development environment, it's really best if it can run any type checks in an IDE and provide instant feedback for the user. Uh, fit some of their development feedback flow, feedback loop. Uh, language servers connect a type system to an IDE. Um, they can run the compiler in the background and rerun when a user saves a file. So popular languages such as TypeScript and Flow both contain a language server. And then the last one is transforming code. Uh, many type systems contain code which is not supportive in native JavaScript. So for example, type annotations are not supportive, so they must transform the code from unsupported JavaScript to supported JavaScript. As mentioned earlier, 
uh, we will be focusing on point one, so on performing the type checks. Uh, if it seems valuable, we can explore language servers in the future. Um, and my videos on web bundlers and source maps that you can see in my channel uh, go into more detail about that point three, the transforming code. So see those videos for more information there. So how does a language compiler work? Uh, next, we're going to have a look at the steps required to perform all the previously mentioned jobs in an efficient and a scalable way. There are three common stages to most compilers in some form or, an, or another. Uh, the first stage is passing the source code into AST. It includes the lexical analysis, which is turning a string of code into a stream of tokens. And then the second step, which is syntactical analysis, which is turning this stream of tokens into its AST representation. Parsers check the syntax of the given code and the type system will have to house its own parser, often containing thousands of lines of code. Uh, the Babel parser contains 2100 lines of code just to process those code statements which, are, which can understand the syntactical analysis of uh, its compiler and also append its additional types. The Hegel uh, parser appends a type annotation property to code which is type annotations. And TypeScript's parser is a whopping 8600 lines of code. It houses an entire superset of JavaScript which requires the parser to understand all of it. Second step is transforming the nodes on AST. So we're gonna, that's where you would manipulate any AST nodes. Here, any transformations to apply to the AST are performed. And the last part is generating the source code. So there you turn AST back into a string of source code. So the type system will have to be able to map any non-JavaScript compliant AST back to native JavaScript, and that's where the generators come in. So you might be wondering, how does a type system fit into this? So the type system compiler jobs, first from a TypeScript perspective. As well as the mentioned steps before, type, compi type system compilers will usually include an additional step or two after passing, which includes this kind of type specific work. On a side note, TypeScript actually has a total of five phases in its compiler. They are the language server pre-processing, the parser, the binder, the checker, and the emitter. As you can see, the language server contains a preprocessor which triggers the type compiler to only run over the files which have changed. This will follow it, so it follows any import statements to determine what else could have changed and which would need to be included in the next rerun. Uh, additionally, the compiler has its own ability to reprocess the branch of an AST which has changed, which is called known as lazy compilation, and there's more on that in a minute. So uh, back to more kind of general type systems. Uh, there are two common jobs to type system compilers. First one is inferring. Uh, inferring is required for code which does not have an annotation. Uh, usually using a predefined algorithm, the engine will calculate what the type of a given variable or function is. TypeScript uses the algorithm best common type inside of its binding phase, and that's actually the first of the two semantic phases. It consists of each candidate type and picks the type that is compatible with all the other candidates. And then contextual typing comes into play here as well, which is essentially using the location in the inference. TypeScript actually introduces the idea of symbols. These are named declarations, which connect declaration nodes in the AST to other declarations contributing to the same entity. So that's how it connects those. Uh, they are actually the basic building block of the TypeScript semantic system, that's symbols. Uh, job two is checking. Uh, now that job one is complete and the types have been assigned, the engine can run its type checks. Uh, they check the semantics of the given code. Uh, there are many flavors of these types of checks, ranging from type mismatches to type non to non-existing types. For TypeScript, this is the checker's job, which is the second semantic pass, and it's 20,000 lines of code long. I, I feel that really gives us a strong idea on just how complicated and difficult it is to check so many different types across so many different scenarios of things going on. The type checker is not dependent on calling code. So if the file executes any of its own code, it, do it doesn't matter if the file executes its own code or not, the type checker will process each line in the given file and run the appropriate checks. So that's how type checking works. It's not dependent on any execution. A couple of the additional concepts, which we'll not dig any further at deeper into today due to their complexity, but I thought are worth a mention. Uh, one is lazy compilation, which is a really common feature for modern comp compilers. Um, they will not recalculate or recompile a file or an AST branch unless absolutely required. TypeScript's preprocessor can use AST code, which is stored in memory from a previous run. It has massive performance boosts as it, as it, as it can just focus on running over a small part of the program or a node tree, which has changed. 
So TypeScript uses this idea called immutable read-only data structures, uh, stored in what it terms look-aside tables. Uh, this makes it easy to know what has changed and has not changed. There's also soundness. Uh, so there are certain operations which a compiler cannot know is safe at compile time and must wait for runtime before it can know this. Each compiler must make difficult choices as to what will and will not be included. TypeScript has certain areas which are said to not be sound, so they require runtime touches. Again, we won't be addressing any of these features in our compiler as they're all additional complexity and not worth the time of our kind of small proof concept. So that's the end of the overview. On to the more exciting stuff now get into building our own. So we're going to be building a compiler which can run checks for three different scenarios and throw a specific message back for each. The reasons we're going to limit it to three scenarios is that we can focus on a couple of the specific mechanisms in work around each one and hopefully by the end have a really strong idea on how to introduce more of these complex type checks. So we'll be working with a function declaration and an expression, and the expression is actually going to be calling that function. So those are the two main things that work here inside our compiler. So um, onto the scenarios. So there are, th as mentioned, three scenarios. First scenario is there's an issue with a type matching a string versus a number, as we can see. Second scenario is issue with using an unknown type, which is not defined. And then the third scenario is issue with using a property name not found on the interface. So the first one throws an error with the string versus number, second throws an error on its undefined type and then using this undefined type, and then the third one is uh, throwing on using a, a property that doesn't match the interface. Um, so onto the compiler, there, there are going to be two parts of the compiler, which is the parser and the checker. As mentioned previously, we're not going to be digging very deep into the parser today. We're going to be following this Hegel approach, parsing approach, of assuming that a type annotation object has already been attached to all the annotated AST nodes. Um, and I've hard-coded these AST objects, so we'll see in a moment. The parser is going to be hard-coded. So scenario one, uh, so again, all three scenarios are gonna be hard-coded. Scenario one will be using this parser. You can see the expression AST block for our top line expression statement on the left, and the declaration AST for where we have declared our function on the right. Uh, we're gonna return a program AST, which is a program with both AST blocks in at the bottom right, the program body is an array holding these objects. Inside the declaration AST, uh, you can see the type annotation object, uh, and there's the param identifier A, which is matching where it sits in the code. So you can see that type identifier name A. Onto scenario two, again, hard coded. Very similar to scenario one with its expression, declaration, and program AST blocks. So those three blocks. However, the difference is, that, is with the type annotation uh, inside the declaration. The param is made up type, as you can see there, type annotation and then type, uh, instead of what scenario one has, which is the number type annotation. So if we go back, you can see the type annotation type is number type annotation, and then here, type annotation type made up type. So, and then after that, the expression and the program AST blocks are identical. On to our final scenario. Scenario three, hard coded. So as well as the expression, declaration, and program AST block blocks, there is also an interface AST block, which is on the far left there, which holds the AST for our interface declaration, as you can see. Also, the declaration AST on the right now has a generic type on its annotation, as it takes an object identifier, which is person. So you can see, type annotation, generic type annotation, and then ID has got type identifier, and then name person. Uh, the program AST will return an array of these three objects for this scenario. Uh, as you can see from this slide and the previous slides, the main area that holds the type annotation for all three scenarios is the declaration param. Uh, all three have that in common. So now on to the part of the compiler which does our type checks. Um, it needs to iterate through the program body AST objects and depending on the node type, do the appropriate type checks. So we'll, we'll be adding errors onto an array and return that array for the caller to print. So before we go any further, um, the basic logic we're gonna work with for each type is this. For our function declaration, we're gonna check the types for the argument are valid, and then check each statement in the block body. For our expression, we're gonna find the function declaration for the caller, grab the type of the declaration's argument, and then lastly grab the type of the expression's caller argument, and then compare them. So what does this look like in code? 
So uh, onto the checker, this is just the type checks. So this code contains the type checks object and an errors array, uh, which will be used to check our expression and our basic annotation check. So let's, let's walk through the code. Our expression has two checks. We can see um, the expression there. So for the number type annotation, uh, the caller type should be the numeric literal, that's the logic, i.e. If, uh, if the annotation is as a number, the caller type needs to be a number as well. So scenario one would fail here, but so far nothing was logged yet. And then after that, we've got a generic type annotation scenario. Uh, if it's an object, we search the tree for the interface for the interface declaration, you can see, and then check each property of the caller on that interface. Uh, any issues get pushed onto the errors array with a helpful message about what property does exist, and therefore it could actually be that property. Uh, scenario three would fail here and get this error with the helpful message. On, on a side note, our processing is limited to this file, as you can see. However, most type checkers have the notion of scope, uh, so they would be able to determine if a declaration was anywhere in the runtime. Ours has an easier job, as it's just a proof of concept. So, uh, onto the process node types. Uh, this code contains the processing of each node type in the program body. Uh, this is where the type check logic is previously pulled from. So we're going to have the function declaration here, and the next slide will be the expression. So let's walk through uh, both of those cases again. Both of those cases. So we can see the function declaration here. Uh, a function declaration is just a you know, function, hello. Uh, so it starts by processing the arguments, the parameters. Um, if, you if you find a type annotation, check if the type exists for the argument type, i.e. the arg type property. Um, it does not add an error to the errors. Um, scenario two would get an error here. So lastly, we process the function body. However, as we know, there's no function body to process. I've left it blank, as you can see at the bottom there. So now, onto the expression statement. It's the second part of our ASD type checker. Um, so uh, an expression being if we were to call our function. Uh, so first we check the program body for the declaration of the function. This is where scope would apply to a real type checker. If no declaration is found, we add an error to the errors array. Uh, next, we check each defined argument type against the caller argument type. If there is a type mismatch, then add an error onto the errors array. Both scenario one and scenario two will get this error. So, what a mouthful. Uh, now we've gone through all of that logic, we can now have a look at what would be output if we were to run this. So I've introduced a basic repository with a simple index file, which, which processes all the three AST node objects in one go and logs the output. Uh, when I run it, this is, this is the output. So you can see our scenario one, uh, we define the argument type of the number, yet we call it with a string, so we've got the error type create string is incompatible with number. Um, so at scenario two, uh, we defined a type on the function argument, which does not exist, and then we call our functions, so we get two errors. One for the bad type defined, one for the type mismatch, and you can see in our errors array, type Craig string is incompatible with undefined because it doesn't exist, our made up type. And then type made up, type made up type for argument A does not exist. So those are our two errors there. And then scenario three, we've defined an interface, we use a property called, called nam, which was not on the object. Um, we are asked if we meant to use name instead. And you can see the, uh, the property nam does not exist on the interface person. Did you mean property name? So that's it, that's it. That's the, uh, the kind of basic, kind of some core mechanisms for a, uh, our, our type check compiler. That's nice work. So before we finish, uh, there are a couple of parts that we've already mentioned that we've had to omit from our compiler. So here's a couple of the big ones. Um, the parser, we manually wrote the AST blocks. These would be generated on a real type compiler, uh, having a pre-processing or a language server. So a real compiler has mechanisms to plug into the IDE and run at appropriate times. This kind of uh, moves us into the uh, lazy compilation. There's no intelligence around what has changed or, or using any memory, so we'll be rebuilding everything every time. Transforms, we've skipped the final part of the compiler, which is where the native JavaScript code is generated. Again, I can refer you to my, uh, my videos and articles on uh, source maps and web bundlers for more information on transforms. And then the final one is scope. As we mentioned, we're doing this on a single file, there's no notion of scope, it can just check the program, um, which is, it's not quite how a real one would work. So, um, thanks, that, that's it. Thanks so much for watching. Um, I learned a huge amount about type systems for this research, and I hope it was useful for you. You can find the repository for all of this code at this link. Uh, subscribe to the YouTube channel for more Under the Hoods, coming soon.
Thanks, guys.